So I'm going to talk a little bit today about hydroponics for home use and a kind of general how to. Um, we will discuss a few separate things. How do hydroponic systems work as a whole? What types of hydroponic systems are there? And granted, there's plenty more that I won't be discussing, but these are just some of the bigger ones that you'll hear about over and over again. What works best for home use out of those systems? Which plants are best for beginners? And how can it go wrong? Because like everything else, it can go wrong and it will. Um, so when you look at the word hydroponics, it's actually was coined in the 1930s by a gentleman at the University of California. And he was working on plant nutrition experiments in a commercial on a commercial scale. So hydroponics is two is based off of two Greek words. So the first word being hydro, meaning water, and the second word being ponos, meaning labor. So basically the literal meaning of hydroponics is water working because we're gonna focus on the water. And when we look at hydroponics, this is one of those big definitions from a textbook that I had when I was in school. Um, basically, without soil. So it's a science of growing plants without the use of soil by the use of inert mediums such as gravel, sand, peat, vermiculite, pumice, blah, 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 all that. So it's basically you're going to use something that's not soil in order to have plant growth and development. That is normal. You're not going to have any stunting or anything like that. So there's good and bad, of course, because there's good and bad with everything. And I will say that this good list, depending on the situation, could eventually lead to bad. And that's kind of why having a good knowledge of what's going on is helpful. So it can be used in places where in-ground agriculture isn't an option. It can be used if there's a dry desert area or a cold climate. Um, places where indoors might be the only option or the easiest option. So there's more complete control over the nutrients, over the pH, over the growing environment, which is good, but also bad if you mess something up, um, but mostly on the good side. Um, there's letter, lower water and nutrient costs because everything's recycled. Sometimes there can be faster growth of these plants because of the oxygen in the root area. And there's an elimination or reduction of things that you associate with soil, pathogens, insects, but that doesn't mean that there are none in these systems. There can be a much higher crop yield. There's no weeding because it's in a system that's sterile, so you don't have to worry about weeding, hopefully. Um, and you can change the height of these crops. They're not at floor level, so you raise them up and it would be easier for crops like lettuce and strawberries, less bending involved. And you don't necessarily have to do crop rotation or fallowing in between crops because it's all nutrient solution. You're not depleting the soil. There's a reduction in transplant shock as well. And with the good comes the bad. There's a few things, um, the initial costs for operation tend to be higher than when you use a soil system. The skill and knowledge that you need is a little bit higher as well. So there is a little bit of research and planning that has to go on in order to properly operate and maintain the systems. And there are diseases that can spread quickly through the system. Uh, these are two fungi uh, fusarium and verticillium, which I do have later on, but know that, like I said, things can enter the system and become problematic. So let's talk about that first question. How do hydroponic systems work? So this isn't necessarily a question, what do plants need specific to hydroponics? It's more towards any plant growing anywhere. Uh, they need light, they need air, nutrients and water. And so whether they're in the soil or whether they're in water solution or whether they're 
aeroponics, you know, no matter what, you need these things. So we'll break those down individually. So this is a the spectrum right here of light. And plants like visible light, and they also use a little bit of infrared light. So Plants require mostly blue and red light for photosynthesis and for flowering, they do need a little bit of the infrared light as well. And, you know, a lot of times, if not a majority of the times you're doing this inside, so you need artificial light sources. So when you're looking at light bulbs, there's a few different light bulbs that you can consider. There's the incandescent bulb, which is mostly red with some infrared, but little blue light. Um, fluorescent lights tend to vary based on the, how they are manufactured. And if you see a light that says cool white light, uh, the cool is mostly blue light and there's low red light. And there's instances where some might work better than others. And there's, everything can be used depending on, you know, what you're growing. And then I just, I like this little chart. So the red light helps plants develop thicker stems and it's needed for flowering and fruiting. The blue light creates a smaller, um, thicker plant that's usually, you know, dark green in color. So, you know, you're gonna think of red light, you're gonna think of tomatoes and cucumbers and things like that. You're gonna see the blue light and you're gonna think of lettuce and other greens. And if you're looking for something in the middle, the center here is more balanced light um, and you might see it said as white light or full spectrum light. And there was an experiment that was done on lettuce that showed that when there was less blue light and more red light, lettuce was milder in taste and had a flat texture versus when there was, when there was uh, more blue light, it was a spicier taste and the lettuce had a curlier leaf, a curlier texture to it. So it does change the way that everything I guess, looks and tastes to a certain extent. So this is a big um, table, but basically, like I said before, when it comes to light, you're gonna need supplemental lighting if you're indoors. Um, and there's a few different kinds of lights that you can use, LED, incandescent, and fluorescent. So when it comes to LEDs, there's pros and cons. It is energy efficient, it's long lasting, uh, it produces less heat, it still does produce heat. You'll find that there's LED light bars that require cooling. And even though they get hot, they are more effective because heat is, you know, the byproduct of the light. So you might need to cool it to a certain extent. It has a wide spectrum of light and there's different sizes and styles depending on what system you're planning on using. Um, the cons for that one is it has a really high upfront cost. For incandescent bulbs, there's the lowest upfront cost and it's relatively ineffective and doesn't last long. And unfortunately with these, when I say it doesn't last long, it's not something that you're going to see that you're not gonna see it getting dimmer and dimmer. It's going to be, I guess you could say internal and it's going to stop putting out as much light and you'll know because your plants will suffer, not necessarily you'll be like, oh, I see it's getting a little dimmer, let me change it out. You'll look at your plants as a way to figure figure out if there's any problem with it. Um, and then fluorescent, they're moderately energy efficient. Um, some only produce blue-green light, uh, some have red, and on the cons, they use more energy than LEDs. Everything's kind of pushing towards LED. There's another one that I didn't put on here called high pressure sodium. And for that one, it's not really, it's, it's a little antiquated, a little outdated, but the thing is it's used more in large scale suited for large growers. So I didn't even put it on here. So we need light for plant growth, but there's some places where we don't necessarily want light as well. So we don't want light at the root zone because it can cause algae growth and it can throw off the oxygen in the water. And we don't want light while germinating 
for some seeds that don't require it, something like lettuce, you know, you don't want light for that. So we talked about light. Now we're going to go into air. Um, and so, so we need dissolved oxygen. And you think about water and it's a solution. So when you have water, you have these molecules that everyone knows about, the oxygen with the two hydrogen atoms, and they're bound together. So plants can't use this oxygen because it's already bound with the hydrogen. So what you need for the air is you need the dissolved oxygen, which is just oxygen attached to itself like this in the whole water solution. Um, so these are no good for plants, but these are the ones that you want. So you need to properly aerate your root zone to make sure that you have that dissolved oxygen and you have what the plants need because it seems a little interesting but you know if you don't have enough oxygen in the roots you can actually drown the plants so there's two types of air options when it comes to these systems there's passive and active and we'll talk about this throughout the presentation um, but passive i want you to look at the top right here so with passive there's no electronics there's nothing to it there's just an air gap so it's above the water right here, and you're going to keep one third to one half of the roots submerged in the water, and you're going to have the rest out so that they can take in that air. So it's it's using the plant's ability versus pumping it in. Um, and when you're and we'll say about when you're beginning to grow a net pot, which is this this guy right here, um, where you start a lot of seeds in and things like that. Um, when you're starting, you don't want the whole net pot submerged in the water. Um, and so those are passive. So this one here, there's the air space in between and not all of the roots are in the water. Because if all the roots were in the water, then we'd have that problem where they suffocate. Then there's active, which this is just a bubbler. Um, so an active system is going to have an air stone or some sort of aeration device. Usually there's a pump on the outside of the container and an air stone on the inside. It's good if you have plants that have different root lengths, like if you have something with a small amount of roots and then you have something with a large amount of roots, you're going to kind of put the water at the smallest roots level and then you have more than that one third to one half amount of roots in the system for the plant right next to it, which could lead it to suffocate. So the air, the active air intake with the aeration device and the stone is going to put that dissolved oxygen into the water to kind of help compensate. Nutrients. So we said that this is something that every plant needs, whether it be soil or water. Um, so you're going to want to use nutrigen nutrients designed for hydroponics and you're going to want to use the labeled rate on the bag um, because you know using too much nutrients could cause problems and you're going to want something to be water soluble so it will it will be in the solution and not just a clump on the bottom you want it to be suspended in it so nutrients are essential for plant growth and development There's macro and micronutrients that plant need. There's 17 total macronutrients are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all those listed. Um, and micronutrients are the others. So macronutrients are needed in greater quantities than micronutrients. Nu micronutrients are lesser quantities, but everything, no matter the amount, is vital for these plants to grow. So this is just from the university, uh, well, it's from Penn State University, and it just shows you some of the macronutrients. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, 90%. Phosphorus, 0.4%. And you're like, Hillary, you just told me that it's a macronutrient. Why is it so little? Well, it's all relative. These, these amounts, you know, 0.4% is considered a large amount. When you look at something like nickel, it's 0.000005 to 0.0005%. And boron is 0.01. So 
some of the numbers might look small, but what's needed for the plant is, is what makes it macro or micronutrient. So water, so we've talked about nutrients, we've talked about air, water is a buffer. Think of it, you know, like you're planting in the water, kind of like soil, you're planting the soil. Um, when you're using water, it's going to change more immediate. When you're thinking about soil, the soil has organic matter, the soil has stable nutrients, humus, these kinds of things that make it hard to have a lasting impact on the soil. You can put down your nutrients, you can put down anything, and you know, it's going to leach out to a certain extent, and you're not going to see a huge swing in things like pH. When you have water, you're going to see changes, you're going to see them immediately because you don't have all of that um, lasting impact that the soil has, anything in there. Um, and you're also going to check the electrical conductivity, which is commonly called EC. And so what the EC tells you is the amount of how well water can the water can conduct electricity because in reality you don't want it to you know water is not going to conduct electricity but when you per, put in fertilizers it's going to change and it's going to figure out how well it can conduct electricity because you're putting in salts because when you think of fertilizer another word that you we'll see is a salt. It's not a table salt. It's not a sodium. It's magnesium and calcium salts that are what comprise fertilizers. Um, so you're going to check out your EC in, you don't have to do in all of them, but in some of the more advanced systems, it's something that you might want to do. And just an idea, a general EC for lettuce, you want it to be at like 200 to 300. Um, water also provides stability and availability for these fertilizers, nutrients, and you're going to do water exchanges just to make sure everything is on point. And um, when you do this, you're going to look at the EC because the nutrients aren't going to all fall at the same time. You know, the plants, like I said, we went back to macro and micro, they might need more nitrogen than they need another um, nutrient. So it's going to change differently. Um, and it's going to be a good indication of when you need a water exchange to get those nutrients back to where they need to be to grow. Um, and pests, there's always going to be pests in water, especially if there's humidity, if there's dark root zones, things like that, which could harbor pests. It's all about the water. So you don't want to use tap water if you can prevent it because there's high levels of chlorine, which some plants can't tolerate well. Um, use distilled water if you can. If you can't and you have to use tap water, let it sit out for 24 hours just to kind of give it some time. And then with water, we're going to check the pH. So the pH is considered the potential hydrogen of the system. And now the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. And at the center, seven is considered pure water or, or, you know, more neutral. So when you go from seven to zero, you're increasing the acidity. And when you go from seven to 14, you're increasing the alkalinity or the basicness. So, you know, battery acid is a zero. You want to grab that orange juice every morning that you drink, you're talking about like a three. Um, you're gonna do some laundry, you're gonna bleach, it's about a 13, uh, drain cleaner being 14. So these levels change based on the amount of potential hydrogen. Um, and they're also logarithmic. So if you, for example, if you go from seven to six, seven is 10 times higher. And if you go from six to five, it's a hundred times higher. So if you're like, oh, you know, I was at a 5.5 .5 and I went to a six. Oh, it's not, it's a 0.5 difference. It's not that big of a deal. Um, it's logarithmic. So it could potentially be a bigger deal than you anticipate. And why is this important for plants? Because plants have different needs and each of these nutrients 
are active the most at different pHs. So after adding the nutrients, the pH is normally neutral. A good range is between five and a half and seven. Um, and you can test this with pH strips. If you go to like a box store or a garden center, you should be able to find the pH strips and you just, um, it's like a piece of paper, you dip it in every, like those COVID tests that everyone has known and loved so much for the last few years. Um, and you dip it in and it'll tell you the pH of the solution. So things like nitrogen, uh, you can see the green is obviously the best area for it. The yellow is, oh, okay, we still have it, but not as much. And the red is, you can't get this. It's not good in a plant. So if you have a pH of 4.5, uh, you know, you're not getting nitrogen, you're not getting phosphorus, you're, you're losing some of these macronutrients that are needed to grow. So, you know, nitrogen is good between six to seven and a half, maybe. So, you know, between five and a half and seven, you get a majority of the nutrients and um, macro and micro. And what you're gonna do with nutrients, you're gonna make sure that you read the label of the fertilizer that you're using uh, because some plants will require different nutrient levels, different fertilizers, different ratios. So you're gonna make sure that you read the label. And for example, if you're gonna grow tomatoes and lettuce hydroponically, you should probably keep them separate because tomatoes are very nutrient dependent. You know, there's, they need um, a constant amount and changing amount versus lettuce is more passive. So, but, so while you won't use tomatoes and lettuce together likely, you could do something like lettuce and kale together because they both require a similar fertilizer. So that being said, there is no physiological difference between plant growth hydroponically and growth through the soil. So this is kind of a, um, a, a chart to get us through there, right? So we have soil at the top and hydroponics at the bottom. So when you have the soil, you have inorganics and organics. Um, so you're going to start there with the organic material or maybe some inorganic fertilizer or something like that. And it's going to break down. It's going to break down into the humus. It's going to decompose into the minerals. It's going to go from inorganics like sand, clay, things like that decomposed. And then once it decomposes, it does, it's dissolved into the soil water and into the soil solution where it makes contact with those plant roots and that's how they get the minerals and waters they need. So it's a large complicated system that eventually gets you to minerals and water. When it comes to hydroponics, you don't have the soil to break it down. So this is where you have the inorganic salts, which we said salts like that is another word for fertilizer. So you have the fertilizers that are going to go into the water um, and they are going to dissolve in the water and make the nutrient solution, contact the plant roots and go. They both end up at the same place. Both soil and hydroponics end up with minerals and water contacting the plant roots and being set. So no matter what, we're getting to the same place, just with a few added steps in the soil. So if we're not going to use soil, what are we going to use? There's many, many, many different options. So this first picture here, this is vermiculite. It's made from heating silica. It's when the material is heated, it forms thin layers. There's, it's good for air movement and nutrient movement, and it can be good for root development and nutrient exchange. Um, there's different grades of it. It can be anywhere from a fine dust to extra coarse. Um, the composted Composted pine bark is number two. It's readily available in areas with like a logging industry. Um, I haven't seen it used too much, but that's not to say that it's not used. There's some downfalls of it. It can lower the pH of the solution. Um, and remember, because water is less forgiving than soil, you know, so it, it can lower it a little bit and it can sequester nitrogen depending on the level of decomposition it's been through. The third here is, clay. they're commonly referred to as clay beads, but they can also be referred to as light 
expanded clay aggregate. It's produced when you heat clay to 2,192 degrees in a rotary kiln, and it kind of pops open like popcorn. So it the trap gases make it expand into kind of like a honeycomb structure. It's really good to use unless you're in one of those deep water systems because they float. So number four is rock wool. A lot of times when you're starting plants, you're going to start them in rock wool. Um, and it's made from blowing molten rock, creating these like fiber like structures. And it holds air and moisture really well. Um, most of them require soaking, you might have to soak them in water, you might have to soak them in a pH buffer because they can be a little alkaline um, or basic. Uh, number five, I'm sure all of you have seen this in plenty potting soil mixes. This is perlite. So it's a natural volcanic glass pebble that are, is really porous um, and it's made by expanding rocks at high temperatures. It's commonly used, like I said, in the potting mixes because it improves air movement and moisture holding. And then this here, number six, is called coconut cut coconut fiber or core. Um, a lot of times it'll come in these pots or you've probably seen it if you've done a seed starting kit um, where they come in little patties or they can come in bricks and then you have to soak it. And once you soak it, it quadruples in volume. Um, so you'll have to soak them once they come. And they're actually from the coconut industry, like byproducts, coconut husks that are ground down. And it's great for air and water exchange. So starting seeds, um, you usually start seeds separate and transplant them in after germination. And now you're saying, well, you have a picture right there where they're not started separately. It depends on the, on the plant. Um, this is actually a system that I've had in the past and I was doing um, microgreens in it. And those you can seed right in. See, those are those clay, uh, clay pebbles like I was talking about yesterday. But you usually start them separately and you can start the cubes in things like the coconut core, the rock wool, and then you'll add them into the system. Once you have the roots pushed through the bottom, they're ready for transplant. When you transplant them, well, when you're growing them, you don't want to start with the nutrient solution right away. Um, you know, just water as you're watering because it's a small plant, it can't handle that concentration, it could burn. So once you put them in the system, you'll follow the instructions on the nutrient solution so that it'll tell you, you know, for the first week, don't put anything in. For the second week, do a quarter strength, a half strength, and, and so on until you get to the full amount. So we made it. <laughs> we made it through all the basics. So let's talk about what kind of hydroponic systems there are out there. And like I said, this is just a couple that are the most common. It is absolutely not the every single one that there is. So these are a few systems in front here that we're going to use to talk about what's normally and generally in hydroponic system. We'll talk about it later, but this one is a nutrient film technique and commonly called an NFT. And this one is an ebb and flow. So what do plants need in a hydroponic system? Light. Above the light source, it's indoors. You know, unless you might have something on a windowsill, then that's fine and that's the amount of light you need. But if you have a more intensive system, you'll need the light. Media. And I say generally, because not all systems have media. Um, the NFT system sometimes don't have media. Sometimes it's just grown right in water. The aeroponic systems are just grown right in water. Um, so media is not needed for every system, but a majority of them have, you know, what we just talked about, those six different core, um, perlite, vermiculite, those kinds of things usually has a media water management. So with water management, it's all done in this spot here, which is not where the plants are, right? It's separate from the plants. Water management, if it's an active system, you're going to have the water pump. You're going to have a air pump that's going to have the air stone in it, things like that. Like here, this is active. 
And then this one's passive because there's not necessarily air pump air stone in it, but there is, well, it's active anyway, sorry, because there is a water pump in it. And then you also have the reservoir. And like I said, with a reservoir, it's the place where you're holding the water um, because a lot of these are closed systems. So they, they interchange, they go through where it's growing and then back down. And this is where you're going to do all of your water management in the wet reservoir. You're gonna top off water, you're gonna add fertilizer, you're gonna take anything out that you need to do. Um, it's all gonna be in the reservoir so that you're not interrupting the growth of the plants. So active hydroponics requires a pump, requires an aerator or a timer to make the system work. It's good for large scale crop productions and plants that are take longer to harvest. So not really a one and done kind of thing. And just because I say it's good for commercial doesn't mean you can't do it at home. Um, they can be computerized, but they can be frustrating for beginners, for hydroponic gardeners. Um, but again, not saying that it can't be done, just a little bit of a learning curve. So you'll notice I'm going to start going through all the different systems now. You'll notice I have a circle up here, and they're either going to say homeowner friendly or commercial. Um, and like I just said many, many times, just because I deem them homeowner or commercial doesn't mean you can't give either of them a try in a homeowner situation. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is deep water culture or DWT. So this is active. It has the air pump. It has the air stone. So you have a tub here, uh, black because you don't want the the nutrient system to have the light so that you don't have the algae. And then you have the foam on top that it's going to grow into. I've also seen the foam inside the container, not on top of it sitting like this before, but you have net pots here that you're gonna put all of the um, growing material in. And so it's basically the plants are suspended above the tank of water and the roots hang into the container where they absorb the water and the nutrients. So they have the air pump, so they have the oxygen that they need coming in. It's the most common type of hydroponic system for small scale growers and, you know, school demonstration gardens, homeowners, things like that. Um, and it differs from passive because of that air pump and that air stone. And it's homeowner friendly. Nutrient film technique uh, or NFT. I could put this one as commercial just because there's, there's a little bit more going on and a little more that can go wrong. But like I said, that's nothing to say that you can't give it a try. So you'll notice with these systems that they're actually tilted. Um, so you can see down here is the reservoir where you have the nutrients, where you have the water, everything growing and everything is in channels. So they're grown in channels. This is actually a Disney World if you ever go. Um, the Living on the Land is a really awesome hydroponics tour of their greenhouse. Um, so it starts going through these troughs, the water goes through the troughs. Normally the net pots don't have any substrate in it and the roots are just anchored into it and they go down into those channels. And when they're in the channels, they just have a constant flow of that aerated water. So there's no, there's no substrate in it. They're just growing into the water. And you can try it at home. They can either, there's systems that you can purchase about it or you can also use, you know, you can go to a box store and use rain gutters, things like that. You can make it at home with rain gutters. Um, on a drawback, if a pump, if something's wrong with a pump or an emitter breaks or something, you don't have much time to save the plants because there's no substrate. If you, if the water stops, the water stops and the roots are drying out. So you really only have a couple of hours to save the plants if it's a possibility. Um, another commercial heavy type is the ebb and flow. So with the ebb and flow, you have the plants in a different tray uh, with a porous bottom and the plants are right inside that or, you know, different. It either has a porous bottom. These look like those clay beads. And then there's a 
a drain or something like that. And the nutrients are in a separate container. And then the water and the nutrients are pumped in through the system and then it's flooded. And then once it's flooded for the amount of time that it's supposed to, they collect the water again back into the system through a drain or through a porous bottom. Um, with this one, the problem is kind of the water, you know, because you have all these areas, you have the drain that's going to kind of collect water, or you have some of these areas these sides since you're flowing the water through that might collect water and if it collects water, then, you know, you have some problems with diseases with insects can be harbored where they can stay in that water. There's a drip system. Um, I put this one as commercial. You can look at it and say, huh, that looks a lot like my irrigation system outside. Um, and it is. There's a lot, it's a lot like it. So it can be open and reoccurring, but basically how it works is the water pumps in through these emitters. And there's emitters here, you can't see them. And then it's either going to be open. And if it's open, the water just goes into the floor, the soil, something like that. Or if it's reoccurring, it might be everything that is not needed will come back into this pipe and go back to the reservoir. Um, it's really common in places like high tunnels where farmers grow tomatoes and strawberries in like a long area. And the emitters can get clogged as well for this one. Okay, aquaponics, homeowner friendly-ish. Um, so this is actually my aquaponics system at home. Hi, Sushi, that's Sushi, he's a beta fish. Um, and so with aquaponics, this is more the scale for homeowners. Um, this is more the scale for commercial. Commercial is gonna have a lot more fish, it's gonna have a lot more pieces. Um, so this is the deep water culture here. This is the nutrient film technique. This is the ebb and flow, and this is a bucket system. But basically when you're doing aquaponics, you're gonna have to realize that the quality of water needs to be higher to raise these fish than you know, in other instances without fish. Um, and usually tilapia and things of that nature are used in the commercial side of things uh, because they can survive with a little less than great water. Um, and usually one side of the system is going to get preferential treatment. Like my one fish here, is it producing enough to give nutrients to all these plants on top? Probably not, um, but in a home setting, you can get away with it versus in a commercial setting, not something that you can get away with. Um, and how it works is you don't need to put different fertilizers in with like you do with the rest of um, with the rest of hydroponics because the fish is technically doing that. So, the, fix, the fish excrete the fertilizer and the plants purify the water for the fish. So it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, and there is water circulation pumps. There's filtration sometimes, all of these. In the home systems, you have a pump here. Um, and as it goes through the system, there's actually like a little waterfall to aerate as well. So aeroponics, I did this one as commercial. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna go too much into it. The plants aren't in any media at all. You can see here there's um, d the roots hanging um, and they hang, they have an aerosol or a mist that's sprayed on them of the nutrient solution. Um, so they're suspended in air. Um, again, clogged emitters, you only have a few hours because there's nothing keeping that water around. So if you have a clogged emitter, the plants don't get any water for two hours, the roots start drying out and, and it'll die. So those are all active because they required a pump. They had aerators, things like that. Now this is uh, passive hydroponics. Um, 
then that is when you use the plant's ability to suck up water. You'll see it as the cracky method or the raft method. You can buy it or you can make it plastic buckets, tubs, mason jars, all that. Um, so this one is very homeowner friendly. Um, you, like I said, you might see it as the cracky, the raft system, the passive deep water culture is another way that you can look at it because passive meaning there's no stones, no nothing. So like I said, many, many times, one third to one half of the root system is underwater and the rest is above water. You can use tubs with the the styrofoam and put the plants right in there you could even use um, a mason jar the only thing i'd say with this mason jar is cover it you know paint it or put some paper or something over it black so that you're not getting the um so the nutrient solution isn't exposed to the sun which could leave some room for different algaes and things to come inside. So, and this is one that Amy and I have talked about many times. Uh, while some systems may be passive for the plants, none of these are passive for the gardener. There's a ton to do all the time. <laughs> so what's best for home use? Things to consider, it's up to you, you know? There's the budget, there's the space, there's what crops you're using. Um, it, Prefabricated is probably going to cost you more money. Um, do it yourself is probably going to be a little bit less expensive. You can do it with buckets and styrofoam. And, you know, there's actually a lot of pieces that you'll get from a pet store. A lot of the different um, bubblers and all that is actually from the fish section of the pet store. The space, do you have a lot of space? Do you have a little bit of space and it has to be vertical? You can grow lettuce in tiers. You can't quite grow tomatoes in tiers. So it'll depend on how much space you have. The crop, is it short-term crop, 50 to 60 days? Um, you'll have a little bit more options or is it a long-term term crop, which may be harder to grow in some systems? Plenty to purchase. Um, you know, there's with fish without fish they have ones that look like k-cups that you can put in um just know that there has been some discussion that these are more aesthetically pleasing so it might take a little bit of time to get used to it or you might have some qualms with it as you're going through and some kinks that you have to work out but um, being sold they're aesthetically pleasing to the eye and you can also make it at home uh, like here's that net pot that I keep on talking about. I, I didn't put a picture of one in the presentation, sorry. You can buy net pots. You can make one out of a yogurt cup or a sour cream cup. And see this one, you see how they painted out the, the container it's in versus this. This one's, they, they, they did their research. Um, but, you know, there's plenty of things you can do. Some plants, you don't even need nutrient solution. Like I know I do scallions. Um, those scallions, you don't even need it. You know, I just put them on my my kitchen my kitchen counter right next to the window and they grow like weeds. So there's, there's things that you can make and learn as you go along. Here is a hypothetical situation that I pulled from the University of Minnesota. All this pricing is 2020 and I did double check to see um, it's, it's, it's similar to now. Um, so I'm growing hydroponically and I have one to two five gallon buckets. I'm starting, starting slow at first because I want to make sure that I know what I'm doing. So I need light. So an LED light lifespan is about 25,000 hours. I only need one LED light for these two bucket systems. So that light's going to cost me about $15 and $20 per mount. So that's $25 total. If I run the light for 14 hours a day, every day for a year, that would be 5,110 hours per year. So that one light would last me four hours, uh, excuse me, four years and 10 and a half months, so about almost five years. Um, so with electricity costing 12 cents per kilowatt, hour. So that would be the yearly amount for light for these two systems is $5.44.
So the amount that I'll need at setup for the light is about $25. The amount yearly I'll spend in electricity is about $550, something like that. And then I know I need to replace the light. So every four and a half, five years, I'm going to have to replace the light, and that's going to be another $15. So this is just looking at light for a, a system, a home system. It's a lot like a uh, recipe, and this is, my bet is very small on your computers, I'm sorry, but you can look it up, you know, and you can see what works best for you. Uh, going to a site that is either a university or .edu or something like that is going to be very helpful for you. This one is from Illinois, Illinois Extension. Um, so it's, it's, it's a recipe. They'll list what you need and they'll list how to make it. So it's something that's really feasible even if someone isn't necessarily handy. There's such places that you can find these recipes to make what you want. What plants should I grow? For passive systems, you're gonna wanna stick to something that's leafy, um, that's gonna be harvested frequently after several, several weeks in a systems, you don't want to have plants that you have to change the nutrient solution and change the amounts and the quantities and which nutrient it is, because these passive systems are passive. They're simple. And the more you have to do to it, it negates the passiveness of it, you know? So you want to do something that can handle that, like lettuce, kale, or non-woody herbs. Um, tomatoes and cucumbers, things like that, the nutrient levels must be monitored, must be changed. So that's something that you're gonna wanna stick for. An active system. Um, so you're gonna want in an active system, things that are fruiting like tomatoes and cucumbers. And if there's more than one plant type in a system, cause then the roots can be aerated so that if there's longer roots and smaller roots, it'll be okay to have more than that uh, one third to one half in because the, the water is aerated. Um, when you're looking at these, these different plants to put in, so again, hi Disney World, um, this is an indeterminate plant. You're going to want to look at indeterminate plants if you're doing something like this, um, because basically the indeterminate plants, you can see them as kind of more vining than bushy. The determinant is going to be bushy. Um, and basically, it continues to extend in length throughout the growing season versus determinant, which is going to reach a mature fixed size. What can go wrong? This could be a whole nother presentation, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, light, too much light, not enough light, too close, too far, plenty of different things. So these right here, you can see that while it's not hydroponics, it's soil system. Um, you can see they're really spindly. They're really tall. They don't need to be that tall. Um, so that's something where, you know, the light was a problem. It's reaching to get to that light. This is my hydroponic system at home where I have the light on the side. So all of my plants grew in the direction that the light was. So there's definitely plenty of things with light that can cause problems. Um, and if the light is too much, it can cause leaf distortion. Nutrients, not gonna go into this like crazy. But like I said before, hydroponic systems are less forgiving than soil systems. Um, and they really must be monitored. So there's this thing where these nutrients can become antagonistic, like if pH is off, you know, they can bind, they can do things. So it's the general water chemistry, I guess you could say, in a roundabout way, needs to be double checked often. So there's plenty of nutrient problems, soluble salts, because salts are fertilizers and you're adding fertilizer, you're adding salt. Uh, nitrogen deficiency, calcium deficiency. Here are some examples of calcium. You have this browning at the tips or you have um, some blossom end rot. Um, iron deficiency, you can see the iron deficiency here. The um, intervenal chlorosis, the yellowing in between the veins. The veins are still green, but everything else isn't. Um, magnesium deficiency. Um, 
boron deficiency, any of those micron macronutrients, you can have a problem with deficiency. So common pests, aphids, mites, thrips, white fly, shore flies, you can have pests. Um, and to see what pests you have, you can use yellow sticky cards for monitoring. This is not a treatment. You know, if you have plants at home um, in soil with, with, what, with white flies or with fungus gnats, you know, you see people put these out. This is not a form of treatment, but it'll tell you what you have, how it's going. Um, and then you can use a jeweler's loop to take a look at them and see what they are, or you can bring them into us at CCE Westchester or any of the extensions if you're not in the county um, to identify for you. The problem with these insects is this is inside, there's no freezing period, there's no break in the life cycle. So if it gets really bad, your best bet might just be to throw it all out, clean up the system really nice and start over, unfortunately. So there's common diseases the, that you'll get in these systems. You'll notice that the roots of the plants that are diseased are going to be brown. They're not going to be white. They're going to be in low oxygen. So you're going to start to see this death. And you'll see it on uh, the shoots as well a little bit. Is it preventable? Yeah, you might need to increase your oxygen levels because you're drowning the plants, which is leading to these different diseases. Algae. I know I've said it a hundred times. Um, it's encouraged by light. So you're going to want to make sure that your reservoirs are blocked. So there's no light coming in. Paint them, put paper over them, something dark so that you don't have the problems. And I know it's been a, a, a long time coming, but let's do a quick recap. Um, How do your hydroponic systems work? Well, all hydroponic systems to produce a crop, you need at least some of these, right? Light, media, water management, and a reservoir. How many hydroponic systems are there? Many. They're both passive, like the Kraftke raft system, passive deep water culture, and there's active, like we talked about the ebb and flow, drip, aeroponics, aquaponics, deep water culture, nutrient film techniques. Um, what's the best for home use? Those passive and some of the active ones, the Kraftke raft system, deep water culture, aquaponics. If you want to give it a try, it's always something fun. Um, you're not going to get a lot of output on it. You know, leafy things work best. Um, but anything, you want to try a different system, you want to try the nutrient film technique, you want to go and get some gutters, give it a go. You know, you might have some problems at first, but then it'll pick up. Which plants are best for beginners? You're going to want to stick to herbs, lettuce, and leafy greens. What can go wrong? What can't go wrong? You know, there's always things that can go wrong. There can be insects. There could be water problems, uh, nutrient problems, diseases. It's just managing the system in order to prevent those problems from happening. And here are my resources. And thank you all so much for listening.